I go so far back that I remember when Charles Dempsey's Bryn Mawr students were still swooning about him. Uh, he's now the distinguished teacher, uh, uh, distinguished um, uh, professor of uh, a, 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 a distinguished um, uh, 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 professor emeritus at, uh, at Johns Hopkins and the author of um, a work on the most beautiful thing in the world, uh, The Portrayal of Love, Botticelli's Primavera and Florentine Humanist Culture at the Time of Lorenzo de' Medici. What could be better? Well, I've written this paper in response to Jim Draper's uh, kind invitation to say something about Michelangelo's relief of the Battle of the Centaurs. And specifically the assignment Jim gave me, and I quote from his letter, was to investigate the way visual and literary modes combine, taking into consideration the vital importance and indeed guidance of Angelo Poliziano to Michelangelo's outcome. That's a fairly mighty assignment, I must say. Uh, Jim's referring, of course, to the earliest mention of the relief, Condivi's well-known testimony of 1553, that Michelangelo entered the household of Lorenzo de' Medici between the ages of 15 and 16, that is to say around 1490, and remained there two years until Lorenzo's death on April 8, 1492. In the uh, same household, writes uh, Condivi, there lived Angelo Poliziano, a man of the greatest learning and acuity, as everyone knows and as his writings amply testify. He, recognizing Michelangelo's exalted spirit, loved him greatly and continuously spurred him on in his studies although there was no need, always giving him something to do and explaining it to him, among which he one day proposed to him the rape of Deianira and the brawl of the centaurs. His word is the zuppa de uh, centauri. I like brawl better than battle uh, as a uh, translation of that. Explaining, Condivi continues, the whole of the fable episode by episode. We thus learn that Michelangelo's relief was not carved on direct commission to Lorenzo de' Medici, and hence is probably not an expression of uh, a parochial political iconography, but was instead suggested to the 16-year-old adolescent by the great classical scholar Poliziano as a kind of test or prova the next earliest testimony was written by Benedetto Varchi, speaking at Michelangelo's funeral in four, uh, 1564, who also identified the subject as the brawl, the tufa of the centaurs, when they, inflamed no less by wine than by the uh, fires of love, in the midst of the beautiful wedding banquet, forcibly carried away Deianira, uh, uh, and uh, Varki then adds a new item of information that she is weeping and crying out for help uh, in vain. Uh, and he too adds that the materia was given and explained to Michelangelo by Messer Angelo Poliziano, a man of the very greatest literary learning as much in Greek as in Latin and Tuscan. Both Condivi and Varchi knew Michelangelo well, and indeed Condivi's report, which Varchi certainly read, had also been read and no doubt approved by the master himself, who did, however, object to Condivi's very next sentence, saying that the sculpture succeeded so well that Michelangelo regretted not having taken up sculpture earlier. 
to which the aged Michelangelo responded as recorded in a postilla written uh, as Caroline Elam has shown by his young assistant Tiberio Calcagni. On the contrary, says Calcagni, he, that is Michelangelo, says that his art is sculpture, though he does and has done others in order to please his princely patrons. So we're now confronted by two questions, the first of which is determining Michelangelo's exact subject, since the marriage of Hercules and Deianira is not at all familiarly associated with the Centauromachia, but was uh, uh, celebrated after uh, uh, a, a quite another episode uh, with uh, Achelous. Uh, for this reason, there is fair consensus among scholars that Michelangelo's subject is a well-known one, the Battle of the Lapiths and the Centaurs, part of the legend not of Hercules, but of Theseus, the guest of honor at the nuptials of Pirithous and Hippodamia, in which Hercules plays only a minor role. A drunken set centaur, Eurytion, or Eurytus in Latin, seized the bride by the hair and attempted to make off with her, but was stopped and killed by uh, Theseus, provoking the bloody melee between the Lapiths and the centaurs. The second question I would say that, uh, incidentally, uh, by this reading, uh, well, by uh, the earlier uh, reading, uh, the uh, figure of uh, Deianera being pulled and weeping uh, would appear uh, here. Hercules probably here. The brawl is started uh, by uh, the killing of Eurytion, who is probably the centaur here, though it could be the centaur uh, up here. Now the second question raised uh, by this testimony, and perhaps the more interesting question, is what it is about Michelangelo's subject that would require explanation by a classical philologist of Poliziano's stature and abilities. Now we do know something about Poliziano as an advisor to artists, most famously with regard to Botticelli's Primavera, the complex and very precisely deployed uh, classical imagery of which is unified by its combination of several texts, all deriving from a single interrelated genre. That is uh, the genre of the scriptores rerum rusticarum. The scholarly precision and ele elegance with which these texts were brought together clearly indicate, as has uh, been all but universally acknowledged ever since Abbe Warburg wrote more than a century ago, uh, required the intervention of a philologist and also a poet of Poliziano's exact learning and refined sensibilities. The same is true of Botticelli's Birth of Venus, the imagery of which, as Warburg also realized, follows Poliziano's description of Venus in the stanze and depends even more closely, as Herbert Horn showed, on descriptions of the painter Apelli's lost painting of Venus Anadiomene in five epigrams from the Planudian Anthology, especially as imitated by Poliziano himself in a Greek epigram of his own. And again, uh, Botticelli's Mars and Venus of around 1485 includes a detail of Peniscus trumpeting on a conch shell here that is uniquely determined by Poliziano's discovery of the meaning and derivation of the Greek panikos phobos, panic terror, only later published in his Miscellanea of 1489. Poliziano reports on the basis of the scholiasts to Aretas' phenomena that when the gods were at war with the Titans, Pan armed his wood, uh, woodland cohorts, the satyrs, the fauns, the panisci, with conch shell trumpets, which when blown upon, 
produced a reverberating sound that induced irrational and utterly irresistible terrors in the enemy, known ever after as panic terror after the name of Pan himself, stampeding them into headlong flight. Within a decade of his publication of the miscellanea, the words panico and panique entered the Italian and French languages, later followed by panic in English via the French and by panish, which was only introduced uh, into German in the 18th century. Such terrors, Poliziano, citing a wide assortment of uh, sources from Cicero to the Scolias to Euripides to Synesius to Valerius Flaccus to the Byzantine Nikitas Coniates, de uh, he defined as irrational uh, and terrors that had no uh, real cause at all, unprovoked by any real danger, but at the same time irresistible, carrying away the mind itself. They are phantasmata, like the ones appearing in uh, the empty but terrifying visions of the nightmare. And this la uh, last, of course, sheds revealing light on Botticelli's painting. Mars is not, as uh, so often been said, in a relaxed state of post coital bliss, but is instead tormented by the demons of sexual obsession, a phantasm of venereal pleasure, attended by the goat-legged satyriski who seemed to turn his own jousting lance against him and poke at a tree against which he slumbers, releasing a swarm of wasps who uh, buzz angrily around his head. Poliziano's essay on panic terrors also sheds revelatory light on another key painting, namely Signorelli's Pan, uh, formerly in Berlin, but destroyed in the disastrous fire at the Flaxturm Friedrichshain in uh, 1945. And you see it here uh, as it was in the uh, Berlin uh, Museum. Uh, and thank heavens, uh, this survives in a uh, unique single color negative that was taken uh, before the uh, war. And it was, I believe, Roger Fry who first pointed out that Signorelli's peculiar portrayal of the ruddy-faced pan with horns like the moon, a star-studded kerchief, uh, around his uh, neck, carrying a staff in one hand that in accordance with the solar uh, uh, year curves completely back on itself at the top and is hence completely unusable as a simple shepherd's crook. And in the other hand, he has a pipe of seven reeds uh, I can't see very well from here, but you can see them. In accordance with the seven planetary zones of heaven uh, and is a god of nature. And uh, uh, who pointed, Roger Fry pointed out that this is uniquely dependent upon Servius's commentary to Virgil's bucolics, to the eclogues, in which pan, uh, pan of course means omne or all things, is characterized as the god of sublunar nature. Virgil's Pan is also the god of Arcadia, Pan Deus Arcadiae, uh, as he's described in the uh, Bucolics, the god of shepherds, whom he first taught to sing pastoral songs to the sound of oat and flute. And of course, he's here being greeted by two elderly uh, shepherds. Not the least of Signorelli's astonishing innovations in the pan is his evocation of the characteristic geographic setting and sentiment of pastoral song, uh, set in the late afternoon of a summer's day when the shepherds begin to drive their sheep uh, back uh, home to their pens. When the sun begins to set, 
and the shadows uh, lengthen, as you uh, can see here, to all of which Roger Fry acutely responded in his description of how, in Signorelli's pan, the sun has already set in the clear ether and in it, uh, the clouds, and the clouds lit by the sun's afterglow still compete with its growing light. And you can see the uh, redness of the clouds here. An observation amplified by Hans Posse's description of Pan's coloristic and atmospheric effects with its deep blue sky and a rose-colored horizon lit by the setting sun casting its ever-lengthening shadows. Die tiefstehende Abendson, die lange Schatten. The pan, in other words, is the first Arcadian pastoral in post-classical painting. And it is in this, and most especially in the atmospherics of Signorelli's masterpiece, that I believe can be discerned the most profound interrelationship of the painter and the humanist scholar. It might be objected that there is nothing in the depiction of a Virgilian bucolic scene, not even as supplemented by a reading of Servius, that would have required the uh, intervention of, uh, or the assistance of a Poliziano. For both Virgil and Servius were widely taught in the grammar schools and were always read together. Anyone might have served as Signorelli's advisor, not excluding Lorenzo de' Medici himself, whose poem, The Altercazione, also called De Sumo Bono, includes a sesta dedicating his verses set to the delicate sound of the pipe, he writes, to Pan, the god of all nature, Pan honored by every shepherd whose name is celebrated in Arcadia and who rules all corruptible and generative things. However, in two details, Poliziano all but left his signature on Signorelli's pan. And these are first, the Roman triumphal arch that appears in the background uh, between Pan and the shepherd on the left uh, who holds his hand up to greet the god, as you can see. And secondly, the fantastic image, the phantasm of a mounted horseman formed by a cloud in the sky above uh, and behind the left-hand uh, shepherd. For it was Poliziano who in his essay on panic terrors had discovered that Arcadian Pan was not only a god of the woods and fields, but also a god of war. Pan nemorum belique potens, powerful in war as well as in the uh, woods. Uh, he's here quoting Valerius Flaccus, and that because of Pan's irresistible powers in conjuring up such empty threats as harmless images in clouds, Pan was able to put to panic flight not only the Titans, but also the Persians at Marathon, the hordes of Brennus at Delphi, and Hannibal before the gates of Rome. I must say, since our principal subject is uh, centaurs, uh, I'd like to be able to read that a little bit more closely, but centaurs, of course, are the children of uh, Ixion and the cloud. Now, Poliziano, unfortunately, has not left us a consideration of the story of Hercules and the centaurs, a fact that is especially unfortunate given that the myth of Hercules, together with that of Theseus, with which it is very frequently intertwined and uh, interconfused, is one of the most complex to have survived from antiquity as the cult of the hero spread from place to place with the inevitable introduction of related incidents in the mythology, the local mythology of one or the other locale. The best known version of the Centauromachia is of course that of the battle with the Lapiths at the wedding of Perithous and Hippodamia, 
provoked by the drunken centaur Eurytion, which is a Thessalian myth, with Theseus as the hero, not Hercules. This is the subject of the famous painting by Piero de Cosimo, which we have on the screen, who faithfully follows Ovid's extremely lengthy telling of the story in the Metamorphoses, uh, book 12. Piero faithfully follows Ovid in close detail, not shying away from the gruesomeness of the battle as described by Ovid, in which the combatants attack one another with everything but the kitchen sink. Clubs, burning brands, an altar picked up and uh, hurled uh, at uh, the enemy, a chandelier uh, right here, I think, uh, a chandelier, all as uh, Ovid had described them. Michelangelo, it will be noted, avoided such uh, excess and limits himself only to the wielding of boulders and stones. We could call them stones or we could just call them small boulders. However, a second version of the uh, Centaur Machia uh, takes place at Mount Foloe in Arcadia in which Hercules engages in a great battle with the centaurs, attracted to the dwelling of their leader, Pholos, by the smell of the wine given him by Bacchus, a barrel of which he had in turn presented to Hercules. Armed with boulders, uprooted pine trees, and burning torches, the centaurs set upon the hero, but were in turn routed by him. This is significant because Feliciano, commenting upon all this fasti, uh, where uh, the city of Philoe is mentioned, or the mountain of Philoe is mentioned, uh, refers to this myth. And he adds that in Thessaly, this same battle was waged at the nuptials of Hippodamia. So he identifies the one as a version of the other. And this not only establishes that Poliziano knew more than one version of the myth, but even more precious, he gives his source. And this is not an ancient author, but even uh, but the 14th century Byzantine scholar, Demetrius Triclinius, who wrote a tre treatise on the labors of uh, Hercules. And uh, the story uh, is not itself, of the Centaur Machia is not itself one of the labors of Hercules, but is uh, a kind of sidebar to the uh, myth of Hercules and the Aramanthian boar. And in a third version of the myth, originating in Aetolia, so we have Thessaly, Arcadia, Aetolia, and a part of the story of Hercules and the Aramanthian boar, we strike gold. In this version, Hercules had been promised Deianira in marriage by her father Dexaminos, who then, after the hero's departure, was intimidated by the centaur Eurytion. Good old horrible Eurytion again causing uh, the trouble. And Eurytion intimidated Dexaminos into giving Deianira in marriage to him instead of to Hercules. Uh, Hercules returned on the day of the wedding and uh, a melee ensued in which Hercules killed Eurytion uh, and uh, others tried to carry away the uh, bride but Hercules, of course, triumphed and took Deianira as his own bride. It is obvious that this myth, uh, also including as arch-villain the center Eurytion, Eurytus, is an even closer variant of the Thessalian legend of the Lapis and Centaurs than is the Centauromachia at Arcadian Philoe. Now, unfortunately, I must end on a 
note of uncertainty. I'm sort of like a deer, deer caught in the headlight, the headlights in Medias race as far as my uh, research is going to go. The story uh, linking the Battle of the Centaurs with the story of Hercules and Deianira is also briefly told in Hyginus's Fabulae, numbers 31 and 33, where it is identified as an alternate version of the story of Theseus, Dilapis, and the Centaurs. And Fry and Toda accordingly both propose Hyginus as the source of Michelangelo's relief. However, Vikov, followed by Strigovsky, pointed out that the fabulae were not published until 1535, no impediment so far as Poliziano is concerned, but uh, they were published on the basis of a single man, uh, manuscript uh, in Freising in Bavaria that Poliziano could hardly have known, and this is a bit more difficult. So Faute de Mieux, scholars ever since have followed them in naming the Lapis and the Centaurs uh, as the story Poliziano most likely gave to uh, Michelangelo, suggesting that Condivi, guided by the aged Michelangelo, simply confused Hippodamia, also uh, called sometimes Deidamia, with Deianira. But this rests on a fallacy, I'm afraid, that is all too common among art historians, the fallacy of assuming that our, <clears throat> our inability to explain something reported in the sources results from a presumed error in the sources themselves rather than our own limited understanding. And it is a falli fallacy all too nakedly exposed in, the case, uh, in this case by the certain knowledge that there was an ancient cult myth connecting the story of Deianira with the story of Hercules and the Battle of the Centaurs. And I might add that knowledge of this myth, as opposed to the much more easily accessible of the story of the Lapis, is certainly something that would have required the learning of a Poliziano to explain to the young Michelangelo. It is true that Poliziano, who often cites Hyginus' Astronomicon, never mentions the fabulae, Hyginus' fabulae, either in his published writings or in his lecture notes, and so almost certainly did not know them. However, echoes of the story of Hercules, De Janeiro, and the centaur Eurition also do appear not in any great detail, but they do appear in Pausanias's Achaea, as well as in Apollodorus's Bibliotheca, both of which Poliziano without question knew. And in a maddening, absolutely maddening note to a discussion of the labors of Hercules in his personal copy of the Bibliotheca, Poliziano wrote, I will omit any discussion of the 12 labors, all of which may be found in Triclinius. Thanks a lot, Poliziano. Demetrius Triclinius's treatise on the labors of Hercules, also cited in Poliziano's commentary to Statius, again maddeningly, is also lost. But many tra uh, traces of it have been identified in another treatise on the labors of Hercules, which I have not yet been able to put my hands on, but believe me, I'm on the track, circulating under the name of another Paleologan scholar, and that's Johnny, uh, John Pediasmus. More than this, I cannot say, but if I must end on a disappointing note, I assure you that this will be the next stop in my attempt to unravel the tantalizing riddle of Angelo Poliziano and what I think we may call, with Condivi, Michelangelo's Rape of Deianira and the Brawl of Hercules and the Centaurs. Thank you. <laughs>